So, uh, as I said, good evening, afternoon, uh, morning uh, to everybody who's joining today. And I should also say that um, this event is kind of kickstarting some kind of Caribbean and Latin American disaster related events that we're having uh, at the Institute, kind of leading, uh, culminating at the uh, Deconstructing Disaster Reconsidering Relief Conference that we're going to be running uh, in October on the 19th uh, of this year. Uh, and that conference is going to be at three in the afternoon GMT. So even if you're not a scholar necessarily based or researcher based in the UK, by all means, uh, propose a paper and get involved. We set it later in the day so we can maximize everybody who's able to join. Uh, and there's a there's a call for papers out for that right now. Uh, and that closes on the 10th of June. So um, do do drop us an abstract. We'd, uh, we'd love to hear from you. OK, then. So. Um, on with tonight's talk. So this evening, uh, we're going to be hearing from uh, the Takai Project, uh, which comprises of uh, Adam Heron, who's an anthropologist at Goldsmiths University, uh, Marika Honeychurch, who's a uh, photographer and president of the Dominican Society for Heritage, Architectural Preservation and Enhancement. Also been hearing from Jan Royer, who's a an architecture student, uh, and we're also going to be hearing from uh, Polly Patillo, who is uh, an author, publisher, uh, and co-founder of the Papalote Press. Um, this evening's talk, this, there's the kind of rising incidences and, and casualties and costs of, uh, of disaster pose one of the greatest threats uh, to the Caribbean going forward uh, in this century. Um, and I invited Adam and the team, the Takai team here this evening, because I think their work provides a really unique insight into how these challenges have and are continuing to be met uh, on the island of Dominica. And this project brings together ethnography, architecture, photography, and heritage activism, uh, and explores a collaborative study of locally crafted wooden houses uh, in Dominica. So... I think we're all very excited to hear. I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you for inviting us. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to share this work with you guys. Um, and also really nice to, to meet you virtually because I've been following your work as well on the history of history of hurricanes throughout the Caribbean. Um, and I've found some interesting, fascinating resources through your, or sources through your work as well. Um, really valuable to be able to and I think there's a kind of a there's a real overlap between your work and our own in terms of being able to learn valuable lessons from the future to chart a path forward as we as we wrestle with the various existential threats associated with climate change in the in the Caribbean and throughout the world as well so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, and then we can just kind of get started so this probably won't be it won't be like a standard academic paper well it definitely won't be a standard academic paper um, Firstly, there's four of us to be sharing sharing the, the space. Um, and also it's, it's we're, we're coming from various different backgrounds in terms of our training and in terms of our various specialisms. Um, and that's part of what we feel makes this project so rich. Um, I was going to do kind of introductions, but but um, Oscar's already done that. But as each as each member of the team, as I'm the person who's kind of brought everyone together, um, as part of this project um although folks already knew each other jan will have already known marika and polly already from dominica um all of us are either from dominica by ancestry myself uh, marika and jan both born and raised in dominica marika's there at the moment jan is in cuba as you can see uh and polly is as dominican um as as anyone from dominica because of how many years she's been there um, and, and how committed she is to the island in terms of her publishing work and, um, and keeping the kind of literary tradition of the island alive almost single-handedly. Um, she wouldn't like me saying that because she's very modest, but um, is a, fan, a fantastic resource for the island and, and, a, and a stalwart of, of publishing on the island. Um, so let's go ahead and just do a bit of an orientation. So Dominica is situated, for those who don't know, in the Eastern Caribbean, um, and the pronunciation Dominica just like Marika <laughs> um, is pronounced, uh, is in the Eastern Caribbean, um, situated between Guadeloupe and Martinique, uh, is deeply influenced by the, the Francophone Caribbean um, and those neighboring islands. And because of the rugged topography of, of Dominica, um, it wasn't settled until very, very late, or it wasn't, um, it wasn't the, the European uh, colonial powers that were converging throughout the region from uh, the 15th century onwards. 
um, they didn't move in on Dominica until relatively later because of its rugged topography. Um, it became a stronghold for the indigenous Kalanago, many of whom still, still live on the island and have their own um, territory in the northeast of the island. Um, and the island also has a history of kind of, of, of rebellion that, that kind of runs, runs through it as well. Um, it, has, it has one of the most significant maroon histories as well. Um, and actually, before it was a plantation colony, eventually, eventually in the 17th century, before that, those fleeing enslavement from Martinique and Guadeloupe had already come to inhabit the island. Um, and I'm giving this kind of history of the island and talking about the topography of the island because it's very it's so significant in terms of the course of Dominica's history. And it has a bearing on on the ways in which the island was settled as well. Um, and that we see, and I think this is something that maybe Jan might touch on as well, we see the kind of African and indigenous influences within the structures that we're going to be talking about today. And tikai literally translate as tea, which is short for petit small, and kai or kaz, kas, which is Creole for hut. Um, so the origins were in the kind of the, the hut-like dwellings of the enslaved people and also the indigenous people. Um, just looking through my notes just to see if there was anything else. So it was, it, it was inhabited prior to Hurricane Maria and at the last census count, there was about 70,000 people on the island. I say about because many people go or come through migration between uh, nearby Caribbean islands, as well as residing overseas or studying overseas, as the case may be. But post Maria, although there hasn't been um, a census done, one is due or was due last year, I believe. Um, the numbers are believed to be significantly lower due to migration uh, out migration after the hurricane. Um, what is very significant in terms of in terms of this particular project um, is the environment of Dominica. They say, and uh, this is this is kind of the the local law says that um, the, it has three hundred sixty five rivers, one for every day of the week. Whether or not that is still every day of the year, sorry, whether or not that's still the case, um, there is an abundance of fresh water and the mountains are so steep that when heavy rains fall, uh, flash flooding is very common as are landslides. Um, and there are also nine active volcanoes on the island as well. Um, as a result, there are, there are a range of different kinds of hazards and risks that are posed to dwelling on the island and to settlements on the island. Um, and interestingly, um, after emancipation in, 19, in 1838, um, Dominica's newly freed population, uh, many of whom would, did not want to continue laboring as low paid, as low paid uh, laborers on the estates of their former masters, uh, were forced to leave the places where their huts sat because they didn't own the property on which they, on which they lived. Um, and due to the fact that the, there was a, a, an area designated around the perimeter of the island known as the King's Three Chains, which is a 60 meter, 60 meter strip of crown land, which was reserved for fort fortifications and jetties and this kind of thing um, to do with the, the plantations and to do with the, the um, colonial governance of the island and defense of the island, um, they were able to settle this crown land. So as a result, you've got these coastal settlements, which you can see in the map on the right-hand side, that, that, um, that, that are situated all around the out outside of the island. And the west coast, which is the, Car which is the Caribbean coast, is the more heavily populated side of the island. And in the work that we've been doing, we visited, we, our aim was to do a kind of an island-wide survey, which I'll get into a little, a little later. Um, but we, we went to as many of these villages as we possibly could to try and find Tikai and to speak to their inhabitants and learn a little bit more about the history of these particular buildings, as well as their distinctive architectural features. And one thing before I move on as well, is that because of the rugged topography again, um, and because of the fact that many people had to had to, um, had to move off the kind of prime estate land, which were the more flat portions of land. In some instances, people also had to move to areas they refer to as the falaise in Creole, or the drop or the slope, which would be areas which sometimes were more prone to landslides or closer to ravines as well. So in many cases, the post-emancipation settlement of the island produced more precarious living situations for, for the um, labouring classes of the, of the population, for the majority of the population. But since then, um, many of the estates have been divided and lotted up, so people live in a host of different parts of the island, and yet those coastal settlements still remain the most, the most densely populated. 
although now you have many um many suburban kind of style areas that, that move that move up the up the, the gentler slopes of some parts of the island thinking about areas like canefield or or wallhouse or different areas for anyone who knows Dominica or Jimit, for example all right so just to take you into a little bit about uh the overall project of which the tikai project is is one component and i'll just do this quite briefly because this talks to more to the other things that I've I've been doing um, and less to what we're going to talk about today. But it's useful to think about it in relation to this larger whole and um, to mention some of the some of the different um, some of the different key moments that really informed the the, the launching of this project. Um, so for the kind of beginning of the project, we, we should probably go back to uh, 1979, although we could go far further into the history of Dominica for for other hurricanes, which were also of significance. Um, but as I was doing my PhD research in, in Dominica, which is where my, my mom's family's from, and I was doing research on fatherhood on the island and gathering people's family, family histories, every person that I spoke to, almost every family, the elders who I was speaking with had a memory of Hurricane David. It seemed to, it seemed to be a kind of a moment, of, a moment that, that in which they positioned time. So rather than saying this happened on this year, they'd say whether it happened before or after David. Um, or they'd talk about how their family how the family residence might have changed when a tree was torn down or how they lost their roof at a particular moment or family members even got, got separated after they migrated overseas. And I heard reunion stories of people who hadn't seen their, their parents for many, many years after they left or a father after many years after he left after Hurricane David. So this David was already etched in the memory as being incredibly significant. And then I experienced the Christmas flooding of 2013 where uh, a trough, a weather system moved through with intense rains and and caused localized flooding and debris to be brought down so witness firsthand some of the some of the damage and destruction that these kinds of flash floods can cause and then though i wasn't on the island came tropical storm erica in 2015 which um which caused a lot of devastation in the village that my family's from in Coliho. um and then of course there was hurricane maria which is one of the most deadly um, hurricanes, Atlantic hurricanes on record for the Caribbean region. Um, and after Hurricane Maria and also Tropical Storm Erica, which caused um, widespread damage and devastation on the island, though not, not, as, not, not as widespread as Maria, um, the government in 2018 vowed to become the first climate resilient nation on earth. Um, and it was this big, bold, bold kind of statement. And Anthony Gutierrez, the UN, um, UN director, as well as uh, the Clintons, as well as the as well as uh, other dignitaries, came down to Dominica. Lots of uh, pledges of support and humanitarian assistance and and development assistance were made, and then it set forth on this agenda to become the world's first climate resilient nation on Earth. Whether or not we kind of pick that apart here or, or question that um, isn't necessarily for the kind of the focus of today's talk. But what is of significance is that since then the government, or since 2015, the government has been building lots and lots of apartments and have engaged in a, what they're calling a housing revolution. But that tends to entirely ignore the vernacular, which is what we're here to talk about today. So we're, we've been wrestling a little bit with what the future of housing might be in Dominica, as we've been going around and learning about the past and the history of housing for so many people and the significance and strength of these of these small humble dwellings that we're going to be talking about and then in 2020 came the revival of shape and this is the the ngo that uh, marika uh, is the head of and that we're going to talk about in the next the next slide but that was also a really significant moment for this part of the project because we realized that there was so much there was so much work being done and to be done on the ground in dominica and in relation to the, the restoration and preservation of so many historic buildings. Um, and we realized that there was, a, there was a popular desire for that amongst, amongst many people on Ireland. And, and so with a little bit of funding from these people right here, so I work at Goldsmiths University, we got some funding from uh, the Global Challenges Research Fund, which gets money from the, the development budget, which in and of itself is quite is quite an interesting way to use development money for research, um, but we decided to rework that money and um, and use it for things that we thought are important um, on the ground in Dominica. And so many different components of the project that focus on the past, present, and future. Um, and the project, the overall project, is called the Surviving Storms Project. Um, its fancy academic title is Caribbean Cyclone Cartography. Once we got the funding, it made much more sense to call it Surviving Storms because 
when you come to somebody with this long CCC title, they might not understand what you mean when you're when you're talking to them in the street in Dominica. So surviving storms makes much more logical sense. Um, but the reason we're thinking about cyclone cartography is because, of course, cyclones relate to hurricanes and tropical storms. And then cartography specifically relates to maps. And our aim is to gather all of this information and then to be able to place it on a map of Dominica that's accessible to to anyone at home or, or abroad. Um, and they're able to bring up this information and to be able to learn from these various different components of research of the research. And hopefully that will enable them to, 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 to chart a more quote unquote resilient future, whatever that might mean. In other words, learning from these various different, various different um, resources that we've gathered um, to be able to put them to use in their own in their own lives and in their own ways, or at least just to just to learn from them as a resource for students as well. So moving forward, I'm going to pass over to Marika now, who is the photographer on our project, but also very significantly in this case is the is the head of Shape, and she's going to tell you a little bit about the revival of this heritage, this very valuable heritage NGO in 2020. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So yeah, my name is Marika Honeychurch, um, president of SHAPE, which is actually the Society for Historic Architectural Preservation and Enhancement. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I wanted to give just a little brief history of SHAPE. It was actually founded in 1997. Um, and I think the founding members realized how much Dominica was in dire need of preserving um, our historic architecture, because even back then, um, buildings were being demolished of historic value. Um, and then at some stage, I think it was in the 2000s, maybe 2013, 2014, I'm not sure, it became, shape became a little bit dormant. Um, so it wasn't until 2020 when there was the demolition of the Jean Rees building, which is in Creole style. Um, house um, is when shape was revived and uh, for those who don't know Jean Rees was um, an author she was of British heritage but she was born in Dominica and in a lot of her books she wrote very fondly of Dominica and I think it was uh, one of her books like in Smile Please she mentions her home uh, in Roseau which I think, uh, Adam, if you see in the right-hand corner of the slide, there's a picture of her house. Um, yes, it was about 150 years old. Um, and also to note, there was this very old mango tree that stood, stood in her backyard that was oh, well over 100 years old as well. And um, during COVID, uh, I think it was maybe June or May, uh, Dominica was on lockdown and people were very much, uh, you know, unaware that this was actually happening, this demolition of the Jean Rees building. And it was only uh, a lot of people came to this real realization is when um, neighbors posted on Facebook, the building being demolished. Um, I do have to note though that, I mean, the building itself did go through changes starting in the, I think the 1980s and 1990s, and it should have actually started to be preserved since then. However, it still held a lot of Creole elements inside and it would have been a wonderful structure to preserve or to at least uh, replicate in that, air, in where it stood to show the Creole structure and also had a significant history of uh, this author um, living there. And uh, Jean Rees also, she had a huge cult following around the world. Um, so a lot of people actually came to Dominica to, to visit where uh, she stayed. And so this could have been transformed into a museum, um, you know, that also talked a little bit about Jean Rees, but then also you could see the Creole style of uh, the structure. And so it was very sad that it was demolished. And so what I did, I wasn't a member of SHAPE then, 
So I reached out to one of the members, I think the president of SHAPE at that time, to just see what was happening with, with SHAPE. And uh, a group of us, I also reached out to some other people who were interested in being part of SHAPE. And so we revived it. And um, right now we have, I think, over 50 members of SHAPE. And um, we try and also push through social media um, about the importance of our vernacular architecture and uh, the significance behind it. Um, and I feel like it has reached a lot of people and a lot of people are, are recognizing its value. Um, social media is very strong right now and it's a good source to go through. Um, another building that is under threat is you can see on your left hand side it's the Carnegie Library which was built in 1906 and um, it's one of the five uh, Carnegie Libraries in the Caribbean. Um, it's It was destroyed actually it was destroyed in Hurricane Maria and I should just say the roof was just removed in Hurricane Maria. And it was unfortunate because it was somewhat abandoned. The roof was never replaced. And so it continued to deteriorate inside the wooden, like the floorboards inside. The actual structure, the walls are actually made of cast concrete. So it's still very solid and it can be preserved, but right now it's abandoned. And unfortunately, um, over I, last year, there were about four fires that occurred mysterious fires that occurred um, at the library. And we're still unsure as to exactly why these occurred, but it is still standing strong because of these cast concrete, the, the walls. I do have to say in 1979, the roof did come off as well, but the library members, or after three months, I think were able to, this is in Hurricane David in 1979, the members, uh, I think after th three months after Hurricane David, they were able to get funding and replace the roof. And so everything was fine after that. But unfortunately with Maria, it's been somewhat abandoned and um, also under threat because they want to build, um, they want to demolish it and build a larger, a three-story modern library which of course we all need a modern library, but it does not necessarily have to be in that location. Um, I think that the library can be preserved and um, used as a cultural center, for example. It also has a beautiful garden right next to it. And uh, as I don't know, you can see in the, in the picture, there's a wraparound veranda and it's right next to the ocean. So, you know, there's a beautiful sea of, uh, the, there's a beautiful view of the Caribbean Sea. And um, also culturally over the years, I mean, you'll see a lot of when it was running, the students, you know, would enjoy the building. Um, they would go there after school. You'd see them hanging out in the gardens, um, you know, so it holds a lot of value to Dominica. <laughs> and um we actually did a petition to try and save the library and we received uh, about maybe 6,000 signatures. So it had a lot of positive feedback. There are people out there that really do want to, you know, to save our vernacular architecture. Um, and there's some, there's also, so those are two significant buildings that, uh, you know, one unfortunately was demolished and one is under threat right now. And of course, there are a lot of other buildings that are under threat. I mean, almost every week I see a Creole house being demolished, unfortunately. Um, there's also the Barracoon building, which uh, might be under threat, um, which has a lot of history. It's where the enslaved um, Africans actually first came um, in Dominica. And uh, it's a lot of people feel like it should 
maybe be demolished. But I feel like we do have to, even though it's bad memories, we do have to keep our history to know where we came from. Um, and then around the island in Dominica, you know, you just see these buildings being destroyed. Um, and the Tikai's uh, buildings as well is when we were doing this uh, project and going around and meeting all these people. It was, uh, it was sad to see how many were destroyed and um, just how few left there are. Um, so it was actually very exciting, just to backtrack, that Adam approached me about this project, um, especially because obviously, I mean, we have, uh, you know, we, this is something that uh, we're both clearly very passionate about. And um, so it was uh, really exciting and I am happy that I am part of this project. Um, and as a photographer, it was also very exciting to, to go around and meet all these, uh, these people that had these wonderful stories about living in the Tikais and me being able to capture them and capture their homes. And, um, yes, I do, I do feel like, uh, we're kind of losing, um, we're no longer in, like back then we were in tune to our surroundings and I feel like we're losing this because a lot of the, the structures that we had back then, and I mean, right now, back then, you know, incorporated the tropical climate, um, it, the way how it was positioned, the louvers, the jalousies that uh, were there, that helped the airflow, um, the structure of the, the pitch of the roof at 45 to, you know, to help withstand hurricanes. And um, the, the hardness of the wood that they used, the pegs that they used to join these woods, um, it all played an important role to the structure. And I feel like um, a lot of people are forgetting the importance of that. And you see people wanting to build um, what they consider modern as just concrete buildings with glass windows and shallow roofs, um, which I mean, especially with the roofs, you'll see with that sort of structure, especially in Hurricane Maria, it was greatly damaged. Like a lot of the roofs came off because of the the pitch was quite shallow. And um, it's just sad to see that we're losing that. And just to note that there are a lot of elements that were also taken from the Kalinago structures, like from years ago and sort of incorporated into our Creole structures. And so it's, you know, those those elements have been around for a very, very long time. And uh, one thing I have to note too is, uh, I realized we actually visited um, our community state college and we had a talk about this TKI project. And uh, we realized that there were a lot of people that, a lot of the students that they weren't taught about our vernacular architecture and it was more focused on, you know, structures that are outside of the Caribbean. So we're losing that. And so I think this project hopefully will bring, you know, recognition to the value of uh, the our vernacular architecture. Okay. <laughs> I um I clicked I clicked over the slide just because that transitioned us in oh, quite yes. nicely to that yeah. to that because I so I just wanted to just touch briefly um on our research process which Marika already mentioned we so just to take you take us back a few steps the aim was to was to engage in this interdisciplinary collaboration so between a photographer Marika between um, architects Jan is a fourth year architecture student. Um, in architecture and urban design, if I'm not mistaken. Shake your head if I am mistaken. Okay, <laughs> good, good. Um, in, in Havana. Um, and also Olive Bell, who is our architectural lead on the project, who's kind of been in the background, mentor in Jan, as well as Mitzi Didier, who's some of her drawings you'll see later. And she is in the furthest rightmost slide, you can see where she's helping one of our student interns with some with some notes and some sketches there. 
Um, she's currently studying in China. Now, for us, COVID was in one way a small blessing to this project because it meant that both Jan and Mitzi returned home to Dominica and were on island at exactly the time that we were engaging in our surveys. We were moving around to various different communities. But before we began the survey, we went to the Dominica State College, as Marika mentioned, myself, Jan, Marika and Olive um, spoke to the students all about the Tikai um, project that we were going to be undertaking and invited them to engage in a competition where they would meet someone who lives in one of these houses. Um, they talked to them a little bit about the history of the house, about their experience of living there, a little bit of the biography of the person themselves, um, knowing a little bit about how the, the human comes together with their dwelling. Um, and then they'd submit it as a competition. And through the support of the two lecturers who you can see both in, um, in shirt, kind of uh, pinky colored shirts on the left and right. So Mr. Ito on the right and Mr. Geist on the left, both of them supported us to find three candidates who would be interns that would come and join us. And the aim is that they would be future custodians of the, the vernacular. And as Marika's mentioned, they didn't actually get in any of their training any, um, they don't have access to course texts about Caribbean um, architectural design. So we felt that that was something which could be, which was missing. And that was where Polly came in as a, but not only because she's also a member of Shape, but also as a publisher, um, we had quite early on realized that we wanted a public access, publicly accessible book um, which could be used as a student text so that they would have access to um, this knowledge, basically, the knowledge which one or two of their classmates had been gathering, but that could then be integrated into the syllabus in future so that there would be at least some, some study of the vernacular, particularly a style of housing which, which is going to, we think, is going to be important as we, as we take on the effects of climate change. And so here we are out doing field work. Um, Jan in the bottom left is interviewing someone in Newtown, uh, a part of Roseau, just to the a neighborhood in Roseau, just to the south of, of town. Um, we've then got myself and Jan uh, inspecting uh, a guy called Sherman's house in Maho in the bottom right there. And it was amazing speaking with him because he's a carpenter. And so he was able to tell us all about the, the intimate details of the wood and how to work the wood um, and so on, which we'll talk about a little bit later. And there's Marika, of course, taking photos in the middle, um, in the middle bottom one. So I was just going to give a little bit of history of the Tikai. Um, Marika had actually mentioned some of the details, so I'll just kind of fly through it relatively fast, but just to kind of give us a bit of kind of historical context. Um, the Tikai is a carefully constructed Creole dwellings um, of Dominican laborers and smallholders, so both the laborers on plantations as well as, um, as, well as smallholders, so the, pe the peasantry that emerged after emancipation, people who fought to have their own land and to grow for themselves. Um, and it has 400 years of cultural cross-pollination. Um, firstly, if we begin with the Kalinago, as, as Marika mentioned, um, their design and construction inspired by Kalinago knowledge of seasonal weather patterns. Um, they knew about hurricanes and they actually instructed and guided those that were arriving about these seasonal patterns and the, the different, the different, the dry season came to be known as the Kawem as well as the rainy season um, and the various different kinds of weathers that would be expected. And they had these Muinia houses, and excuse my bad pronunciation of indigenous language, um, but they had these Muinia A-frame houses, which were tightly bound A-frame houses, which, um, which uses various different kinds of woven grasses. Um, but with the hurricane, the, the grasses might be stripped away, but usually the tightly bound frames would remain. And this is one of the kind of the elements that to some degree will have inspired the Tikai. Now it's a bit of a puzzle finding, just like any kind of teasing out the various different strands that go into the creolization process and produce something entirely new. The, the process of locating origins can be a kind of a futile task sometimes, right? Um, although it's interesting to find the various different inspirations that, 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 that go into the kinds of blends that would, would emerge. Um, and if we look west, if we look east, sorry, to, to West Africa, we can think about the Wattle and Dub housing. So we're looking at the top left now, and this is actually taken from a, a village in, in Dominica or Golte houses as they came to be known in Creole. Um, and again, these are, these are, um, these are clay walls um, bounded onto a wooden kind of woven, 
um, onto wooden woven materials. Um, and then with thatched roofs as well. Um, and they'd also be situated within a communal swept yard, which was significant. So you'd have multiple houses around a yard, which was then incorporated into the Tikai Laku, as it would come, as it would become known, La Court, the court in, in French, the courtyard. Um, and the Laku itself, as, as we came to learn, is as important as the house itself. Um, an amazing thing about having Olive on the project, so Olive Bell, who I mentioned before, who is our, who's our architectural lead, she also grew up in the Tikai in Girardel. And it was interesting from her learning that most of the life of the Tikai unfolds within the yard itself. You only sleep in the, in, the, in the dwelling house and you spend the rest of the time between the kitchen outhouse with its, with its hearth, with its fire, um, and the outdoor space within the yard itself, whether that's, whether that's in work um, and tending to animals or, or, or plants, um, food stuff growing around the house, or whether that's in play as young, as young children, just moving around, enjoying yourself. And then interestingly, this, uh, this image of a, or from an etching of a ship, um, this is a ship that sailed from Bristol where I am to Dominica. Um, and it, it traded with um, the Canary Islands along the way in the 18th century. Um, and the reason that that's there is because the joinery, the kind of joinery which we'll learn about from Jan shortly as she takes us through some of the architectural features, the, the principles of joinery in, uh, in terms of the, the, the tightly bound frames of the tikai, which are incredibly strong and incredibly vis um, resistant to, to storms and are flexible as well in, in the case of, of seismic tremors, um, they emerge, it's believed, from European shipbuilding. Um, so the very ships which would have brought the, the enslaved, our, our enslaved ancestors to the Caribbean um, also will have, will have um, the techniques of how those ships were built will have in, been incorporated into their dwelling houses as well. Um, and then we've got the European thatched cottages of the, of the, um, of the Anglo-French Channel. Um, so between England and France, both which have a kind of a colonial footprint on Dominica, um, we see the we see the cottage on the bottom right, which which to me has a kind of that half hip form, which we're going to learn about in terms of the roof style of the tikai as well. Um, so in each of these in each of these aspects, that I've kind of traced us us through um, between the Amerindian, the African, and the European. Um, we see elements, we see traces that found their way into the into the houses themselves, but also the ways in which people were dwelling around the house in the yard and so on as well. So I'll move on now and pass over to Jan, um, who can tell us a little bit about the architectural features of the houses themselves. And I've chosen to focus in on this particular house because Mitzi, who is Jan's, um, Jan's partner, partner in architecture, um, who has done most of the illustrations for this particular house. So over to you, Jan, if you wanna speak through some of the different architectural features. Hi everyone, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are um, and whatever time of date is. Hi, uh, my name is Jan. I am assisting with the Tikai project. So just to explain some of the architectural elements of a typical Tikai. Um, the Tikais, uh, can everyone hear me? Okay, cool. The traditional tikais. Now, we found that there was no major difference in the tikais, depending on where we found them in the island. So the ones that were closer to the sea were relatively the same as the ones that were more inland. And they have a structure of about, it's, a, it's on a frame of about 20 feet. So that's six meters by six meters in a grid. Um, it's raised, as you can see in the middle photo, it's raised about two or three feet from the ground on concrete and stone pillars, I guess that's for flooding. And in some cases it was used for storage at the bottom. And it would comprise of a grid, like you can see at the top in the two rooms, they could add on to them and have four rooms and the grid would multiply in twos and in fours. And it would comprise of a, a bedroom, a living room, a dining room, and additional an additional bedroom or storage. And you would find that the kitchens would be built on the exterior in case of a fire, because um, these houses traditionally people would cook on coals and fires, like open fires. So it was it's a wooden house; it would be a hazard. Then you have the outhouses would be at the on the exterior. So you actually have to leave the house to go into the bathroom. 
So these houses were mainly bedrooms and living rooms, right? Then you have a timber frame with a truss system for supports and wooden walls, wooden shutters. So all, this house is almost entirely made of wood, right? In recent, I would say post 1940s is when they introduced galvanized aluminum sheeting to form the roofs. But prior to that, they were made of thatch. And these houses, despite their very simple and humble constructions, have, as you can see in the example above of Fida Luke, these houses have been around for more than 60 years. Some of them have been 100 years in some cases with very, very little damage. When we've had to interview the people, the residents who live in, this ho in these houses, and they give us a history for the, let's say the initial cost of the house and the initial construction, they've had to do very little changes. You know, even, even paint, they've rarely had to paint because the shingles don't need to be painted. They've, ha they've not had to um, change the, the roofs during hurricanes because the roofs would withstand the hurricane strength winds. They would maybe add onto the houses. And in some cases where we've seen that people have made additions to the houses or changes, the changes do not work in their favor. For example, these houses, if you're sitting in the living room, for example, there's a, a, a brilliant example of the truss system that's used to support the roof. So you have these bars that go across, these wooden bars, and they are in T shapes and they are in um, truss, a, 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 truss, a truss system, right? You can see it in the last picture, just about mid season. And in one of the cases, the person didn't like it, so they covered it and they gave it a suspended ceiling. So a ceiling just a little bit above your head. And they complained that it was hot. But the way that these houses were constructed, they were constructed to take advantage of the cross breezes. So you'd have windows on opposite sides. Every room would have a relationship to the exterior. So you could look outside from almost any room and the hot air would rise. So you have this tall, tall ceiling that peaks in the middle where the hot air would rise and keep the room cool. So these houses, when you look at them from a vernacular point of view, they are so excellent for the Caribbean that it's a mystery to me to, 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 to figure out why it hasn't been a, a, a standard of how we construct. So parts of this project, we're trying to, to, to gain awareness to people, to, to tell them that, you know, you can build like this and it, it's, it makes sense. It reduces the cost of electricity because you have a relationship with the exterior, light comes inside. You don't have to spend the money on air conditioning and on too many fans because the breeze is passed through. You don't have to spend a lot of money on um, upkeep of the houses. If we, if we have to document what upkeep that people have been doing in the interviews that we've done in the houses in the past hundred years, they maybe spent a fraction of what people spend every year, you know, on, on changing doors and changing windows, because these materials are um, symbolic of the era in which they were constructed. They were built to last. So these houses were not made so that in 20 years they would crumble, in 30 years they would crumble. They were built to, with, to, to, to serve generations. <laughs> Someone is com commenting about the cross breeze. Yes, even where I'm sitting right now, we have a breeze. And even the building that I'm acro uh, sitting across, it has an example of um, the rooms having these cross breezes because as we know in the Caribbean, it gets very hot. And, you know, AC and, and fans are, are adding to the global warming crisis. So, right. Um, a little bit about the construction. In the first picture, you can see right where the mouse is. is an example of the joinery of these buildings where they were made almost entirely without nails because nails were expensive. So they were constructed out of wood with wooden pegs. And when you have to understand the architecture behind these houses, there was no one architect that designed these houses. It was passed on with a series of knowledge. So the houses in themselves are just a representation of knowledge and traditions that have been passed on through through word of mouth because we can't really find any documentation about these houses except for the houses themselves and that in itself is worth pres preserving on that note jan i'm going to jump in because that's that pulls us really nicely forward to the to the next slide which is talking about these dwellings which are so well adapt adapted to their total environment right so there were so many there's so many interesting things in in what you said um which reminded me of this quote by jan morris which comes from the 
the introduction to Caribbean style. So Polly in, in her slide, which is coming next, um, is going to speak to you a little bit about the book that we're, that we're writing, but also about um, the one or two other books which previously existed from the 80s, which are now out of print. And one of them is called Caribbean Style, which is the other kind of main, main book on, the, on Caribbean vernacular. Um, and in the introduction, Caribbean vernacular architecture is described as a meteorological art form. So basically taking a response to the elements, to the weather, to the arc of the sun, to the, the, the falling of heavy rains, to the directions of the wind, and has created a thing of beauty from that. Um, and there's an incredible skill in these traditional drafts, drafts people and, and carpenters, as, as Jan mentioned, who have, who, have, who have been able to draw upon the materials on their island um, and to create something which is incredibly robust and durable. And just some notes which I'd kind of mentioned, which I'd noted before, um, they're orientated so that the doors face east to greet the rising sun in many instances in the rural context, like the one you'll see at the bottom. Um, and that they're also orientated east so that the, so that the trade winds um, offer cooling breezes which move through the house. By contrast to, um, to many concrete houses, which as, they, which as many people spoke to us, they say that the, dom they say, say that the tikai is built with the wind, right? As Amy, who's one of our um, one of our interns on the project, said, they were built not against but with the motion of the wind. Whereas a lot of concrete houses pay no regard to that, and so you just have a wall which meets wind, and so as a result, you don't get the fruit breezes as Jan has, has mentioned. And then, interestingly as well, you've got tropical hardwoods which were cut by the cycles of the moon as well. So these people who were the 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 um, tree cutters who were who were cutting down the specific hardwoods which they knew and which they there were specific woods which were used for each component according to whether they're going to be inside of the house outside of the house how they're gonna how they're gonna last or degrade over time and so on as well um, they'd be felled in the heights high up in the mount, high up in the mountains um, and then they'd be dragged down um, they'd be sawed into into posts and 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 boards and then dragged down and as you can see from Laplane on the East Coast in the top left slide, you can see um, some of the guys who are in the middle of doing the pit saw work, which in the process of doing that sawing, where there'd be another guy above who'd be on the other end of the saw, um, there were there's a whole culture of, of song and chants that would go with that, that would propel the work forward through the, through the rhythm of the song as well. Um, and in the Alan Lomax ar archive, you can actually find these, these original recordings from Dominica in 1962. Um, and one thing that's amazing as well in relation to these hardwoods is that the, the kinds of um, joinery that we'd spoken about before, um, over time, the wood fuses. So you see how, um, how metal, when metal is joined, over time it corrodes with weathering and with moisture. Um, that wasn't the case with the, with the woods in these houses. Actually, what happens is that the, 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 um, the joinery using doweling or using pins and pegs as people refer to them locally um, and the mortise and tenon joints, they fuse over time, which means that each of the members, each of the posts uh, become one single hole, which is stronger than the sum of its parts. So the house is both flexible, it's able to move because it's made of wood, but also it's robust and durable. So the members don't, don't come apart. Um, so much so that in this case with, a, with a, um, an image that was shared with me that's telling me that I'm running out of time so I should go ahead but let me just go back and just talk to this one photo very quickly from 1979. This is a day or two after Hurricane David. This was taken by Lennox Honeychurch who's Marika's uncle who's a, a, a wonderful national historian of Dominica. Um, he'd taken a walk and he was in he was in Pottersville and basically Hur Hurricane David had thrown this house across the street out into the middle of the road and you can see local residents looking on at the house perhaps almost in amazement the house has completely stayed um, together but it's just been thrown from its um, from its foundations and shifted um, and I can probably recall off the top of my head at least five accounts of different people who we've spoken with um, Olive was one of them where she talked about her grandmother's house moving as a result of Hurricane David. Um, uh, someone else, uh, um, Fidel, uh, not Fidel, um, Sherman Esprit for members of the team. So a guy um, in, in the heights of Maho in an area called Campbell, his house was moved as well. So many of these houses were moved and yet they stay together. Um, so they, they're built with the hurricane as Oliver's put it before. They allow the hurricane to be. Um, and she almost sees it as a kind of a cosmological oneness with the hurricane. 
um, they, there's a to, there's a respect for the total environment in which the in which the um, the houses are constructed. And going back to Fidel Luke, his nephew was there at the time, who's a who's a carpenter. So this guy here, his his nephew, his nephew was there on the Saturday morning when we came to visit them who's a carpenter, and he referred to that knowledge of the, the elements as being, as being an old-time science, um, a, deep, a deep intuitive knowledge based on observation of the natural surroundings in which people inhabit, and they've built their houses accordingly. All right, over to you, Polly, to talk a little bit about the book. You're muted, you're muted. Sorry, I'm back, I'm okay. Good, okay. Um, lovely to see some of you and to know that uh, a lot of you are there, wherever you are in the world. Um, what you're seeing here is um, the cover of this forthcoming book, Still Standing, which, is, which will be the end result, as it were, of everything that we've talked about today. But I just want to tell you um, a little bit about the background to the process of um, publishing this book. I, um, although I'm British and used to be a journalist in, the, in London, I've been coming and going from Dominica for many, many years. And uh, a little time ago, I started this small, very, very small publishing company called Papiot Press which specializes in books about Dominica. And since the start, when it just used to be Dominica, it's now expanded to the wider Caribbean. Um, after Maria, I'd been sort of thinking how we could pay tribute to the people of Dominica and the island itself. And I had actually published a remarkable series of poems by a Dominican poet called Celia Sorrento about um, the experiences of Maria. But I thought that maybe there was another way to document um, this trauma. And so naturally I was thinking about a book, but in what form? And at about this time I met Adam and had become involved in shape and anyhow was living in Dominica. And um, I think Adam said that he had a vision for the book and I feel that that is an appropriate way of looking at it in a way. But when you start publishing a book, you have to think, um, what are the precedents? Is there anything else there that, um, that duplicates or are you doing something new? And in this instance, it's certainly something new. This is a very undocumented area in, in terms, I think, of Caribbean architecture and definitely in terms of Dominican architecture. And we wanted to celebrate um, the vernacular architecture of Dominica as a way of incorporating and paying tribute to the Creole culture of Dominica, of which, like in dance and music and language and dress, the architecture of the Tikai is definitely in there as, as a very essential part of being Dominican. So we didn't have much to go on. Um, there were these two books, as Adam had um, mentioned, the Caribbean style, which is the cover in the middle. This was a very glossy um, coffee table book that was published by the British publisher Thames and Hudson as part of their sort of global style. It's a big, um, beautiful photographs, but essentially it was about the grand houses, the grand designs of Caribbean architecture, the plantation houses, the merchants' houses. It was also very much orientated to um, the, the French Caribbean, the colonial French Caribbean. Um, there were a few mentions and a few glimpses of the more vernacular architecture, the rural, the homes of the rural poor, 
But this was very much just as a glimpse. It was not an essential part of the book. Also, there was nothing about the people who lived in these homes. There may have been just images of them, but they were certainly not central to the book. The one on the left, Casantier, is extremely interesting. Once again, like Caribbean style, it's out of print. Uh, it's more, I suppose, a, a very considered technical look at the Tikai. It's written in, uh, it's very text heavy. It's written in French, English, and Creole. And it does go into great detail, architectural detail, and it was an enormous sort of inspiration to us in a way. But it certainly was not exactly what we wanted to do. And then on the right hand, we see historic um, Roseau, which is um, Lennox Honey Church's invaluable book, again, out of print, about the homes and buildings of Roseau, the, the capital of Dominica. So we didn't really, um, we were in uncharted territory and it was a wonderful opportunity for me to do something slightly different as a publisher, because usually I sort of sit in a, at a desk and commission books and they arrive and then there's the editing production design process. But in this case, I was actually able to be there on the ground um, and doing some research with the team of Adam, Jean, Marika, and other people. It has been quite an adventure to go out into the, um, to the villages and say, any, any old wooden houses still standing? Where can you guide us to these? And we would go off some little track and, and then the, the house would probably, nobody would be there or it would be there, but it wasn't quite right for our purposes. So we would then um, say sorry, and then we would go off somewhere else. And then we would find some amazing home, like for example, this, this picture that we've shown, which is um, the cover of our book, which is a book, um, a tikai that um, Adam has already commented on, the one that shifted. Now this is in a clearing, um, in the in the forest, about ten minutes walk from from the road, and it is an. Ex I love it as a as a cover because it has such authority. Um, just to end, it's really saying I'm not going anywhere, and there I am, and still standing. So we're looking forward to putting this book together, and that you will all be able to. Um, read it later this year. Thank you. Thanks, Polly. And, um, and okay, well, on that note, since we're, um, since we're reaching five o'clock this end and what is it, midday, where you guys are, um, I'll just wrap up to this final kind of question or provocation as a kind of, to bring us to a close. Um, Arguably today, Dominica is at a crossroads architecturally. Since Tropical Storm Erica in 2015, um, and then precipitated by Hurricane Maria as well in 2017, um, 11 large housing settlements have appeared across Dominica. Composed of apartment and townhouse complexes, so you can see an example of the kind of apartment complex on the left side there. Um, they're being constructed as residencies for people who were either displaced or whose homes in many instances were deemed unsafe by, um, by the two uh, storms that I mentioned. Um, and that's not exclusively for those people, um, but in many cases, that's the kind of justification behind them. And in one instance, in the case of Petit Savan, where an entire um, village was deemed abandoned on the East Coast following tropical storm Erica, um, an entirely new complex was built to re-situate people um, miles away from their their home that they'd lived in for gen uh, their village that they lived in for generations, um, and they're being built under the kind of the under the auspices of the kind of built the UN's Build Back Better slogan um, and the government's um, uh, resilience agenda, as I mentioned before. 
Um, and interestingly, these particular apartments and almost all of these developments that are ha happening around Dominica are being built by a company called Montreal Management Consultants. Um, and they are an immigration and citizenship investment broker, and they're from Dubai. Um, and basically what they do is they have authorization to sell quotas of Dominican passports, and then they use that money um, in order to build houses, um, which in principle is a really, really useful way to be able to have, um, have resources made available in a very straightforward way in order to meet the housing demands of an island. However, unfortunately, these developments don't... Um, they, all, they, go, they go against almost every single architectural principle that we've mentioned in terms of the ventilation of the house, in terms of the orientation in relation to the wind, uh, the shape of the roof, um, every, every aspect almost. Um, they, they entirely ignore the vernacular, unfortunately. Um, and and that is a, that's an issue, and particularly when we think about the context of climate change that pr produces the kinds of storms which, and intensifies, I should say, the kinds of storms which we've been talking about. Um, and as we move towards um, more and more concrete structures, and um, although these are reinforced structures, as we see from the bottom right image, which was shared with me um, from, from Jan uh, in the past few days, this is from uh, Hurricane Maria, if I'm not mistaken. Is that point, Michelle, Jan? I think so. If it's not point, Michelle, it is close to Newtown or close to that that stretch. Um, it looks, yeah, I think it is. To me, it looks like Point Michel may be close to the ravine there, but I'm not sure. Um, but as you can see, the the those shallow pitch roofs, as we've mentioned before, most of these houses which are built in concrete are almost entirely lost their, their roofs and um, incredibly badly damaged. Um, so on the one hand, at one point in the crossroads, we've got this movement towards concrete, in some cases reinforced concrete that doesn't allow for ventilation. People who live in these in these apartments are beginning to report that they're incredibly hot, particularly in the dry season, um, which we're kind of, which we're coming to the end of, I guess, I guess now, um, and ha don't have a fully open in windows or hurricane shutters or any of these kinds of things that we've been we've been talking about. And on the other hand, there is a move towards towards utilizing or or drawing upon either tikais, which are being restored, as you see in the case of an Airbnb in the top right, um, or in the case of these newer developments, this is Jungle Bay in the bottom left, which is uh, a boutique resort, I guess you'd call it, in, in Dominica, utilizing some of the principles of the tikai um, and the vernacular in terms of the shingles, in terms of the smaller form, smaller footprint, in terms of the roof form, um, the steep pitch roof form, the hip roof as well. Um, people are drawing on those principles, but it seems like more and more those are being orientated towards less towards residential use for the most part of the population and more so towards kind of tourist, tourist use in many, in many cases. Um, so we see that there's a kind of a, there's an opportunity at this juncture, um, but also there's, there's unfortunately in many instances a move away from the various different kinds of features which we've been discussing so far. And indeed the TKI's use of local rather than important, imported materials um, is self-cooling design, as Jan has mentioned before, um, reduced uh, dependence on high emission shipping as well as energy intensive um, air conditioning. So you don't have to bring all of these materials in because they already exist in the forest. Um, and so we're thinking then about, and we kind of throw this open as a, as a point of discussion about the Tikai then, as, and you can see we're obviously quite biased on this point, but the Tikai is almost a model for sustainable future living. Um, and even if not to say, this isn't to romanticize the Tikai because so many of the people we spoke to have so many issues with their, with their houses in terms of rotting boards and these kinds of things. Um, and also for many, they outgrow their, they outgrow their small houses um, as their families grow and so on as well. But the principles of the tikai, where many people throughout history of in Dominica particularly have, have merged maybe three tikais next to each other. So they're having that small form, but extending that into three or expanding the size slightly, as we saw in some rural contexts as well. So we see this as a, as a potential kind of guide for future sustainable living as we confront the climate crisis from the vantage of the Caribbean. Anyway, I'll leave it there. We've gone well over time, but we look forward to Q&A and some discussion. And I'll just leave you with some pictures just to give you a glimpse of the book, um, which is currently 
in process. Okay, wonderful. Uh, thank you very much. I think first and foremost, I just want to say a big thank you to uh, Adam, Marika, Jan and Polly for just such a fascinating talk. And I think just really, really interesting kind of insight into a very, I suppose, inspirational model of environmentally adapted architecture. Um, and personally, as a historian, so interesting to see how, how long that's been um, practiced successfully over time. Um, and as somebody whose kind of research interest uh, kind of lie with kind of British colonialism in the Caribbean, a real, real stark uh, contrast with the way in which, the, you know, British planters and, and colonials approached uh, the building of houses in the Caribbean, resisting any form of creolization as, as, as hard as they could, importing everything down to their silverware and their china from London to hold on to their Britishness at all costs. Um, even when it caused them to faint in the heat or lose their house. Um, and it's an interesting testament to think that so many of the great plantation houses have long gone, leaving behind only their ruins uh, and sometimes just the earthworks uh, where they once stood because they were so poorly designed uh, for their environment. 